That's what Compa said just today. But tonight. Marie Marcus said Let's just lift up our hands and begin to worship God. He's a good God. He's a mighty God. He has done us well. Our God has done us well. Our God has done us well. I don't know about you. I can look back into the sacrifices. Ten days of fasting and praying. Ten days of coming to God and just listening and sitting at his feet for him to just feed us. And I can boldly say that we were well fed. We are satisfied. And one thing we know, God has spoken and we are running with it. Lord, we thank you. We worship you. We give you praise in this house, oh God. Be magnified. As we go into your word tonight, Holy Spirit, we ask that you will help us. Because you alone is our helper, you are our enabler. We know nothing but we rely on you that you will perfect the will of God in us. Thank you because you are God. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And welcome us into his presence one more time tonight. And uh, it's so pleasant to be in his presence. Because in his presence, the Bible tells us there is fullness, abundance, unprecedented, unequaled, un immeasurable presence of our God. And at his right hand that we sit with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is pleasure forevermore. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what the physical is telling us. We key into the heavenlies. And we say we are more than conqueror to Christ who has redeemed us. Amen. Hallelujah. Tonight we are continuing in our series uh, on the study of the book of Romans. The title says, if you get Romans, God will get you. What an interesting topic. So that means I have to go get Romans. Amen. So that I could fall into his hands. And tonight we are looking at the three I am's of the gospel. The three I am's of the gospel. Turn your Bible with me with Romans 1. And I will take it from the 14th verse. It says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Verse 15. So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. Amen. Romans 1, that was 14 to 16. In one of his celebrated sermon, Dr. Stephen Lawson, the overseer of one passion ministry, made a remark. He said, and I quote, is an appeal to the church at large. He said, to every believer, a sacred stewardship has been entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is therefore incumbent upon each and every one of us to invest wisely and aggressively into the life of others. We have been saved to save. We are called to call. Amen. We are not just saved to sit, enjoy the pleasure in the kingdom while we overlook the world around us. God called us out so that we might call them one by one to him. Amen. So these powerful words 
were revealed to us. That is our Romans 1, 14 to 16, were revealed to us what we have, whose we are, and what we must do with that which we have been given. The gospel of Jesus Christ is our greatest possession here on earth. It has been graciously given to us by no other but our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that by grace were ye saved, not of works. Uh -uh. If it was by works, many of us wouldn't even get saved. Many of us wouldn't get there. But he showed us compassion. He extended his love unto us. And the Bible said while we were yet sinners, he gave his life. He laid himself down. Amen. That we might be drawn to him. That we might be brought before the Father and become a part of the kingdom. Amen. We must therefore invest in this life of the unsaved. How many of us have unsaved people around us? And we judge them. And don't you know the kind of life she lives? Are you surprised? Did you not hear? Haven't you seen? Take a minute and look at your life. If God had thought so about you, will you be in his kingdom by now? Christ has come. He has released the mandates upon us. He has blessed us. He has commanded. He has sent us forth. He's not coming back to do that job anymore. When he appears again, is judgment. So the job of redemption, the job of salvation, the continuity of it has been laid for you and I. It's in our hands. What are we doing with that? How many people are you with at your job that you know that these ones are going astray and you just look away? They said we must not preach. They said we must not mention God. But there are other ways we could penetrate into their heart. God has given you all it takes. He has given us everything. Let's not be like that rich man and say, Father, let me go back. Uh -uh. Once it's gone, it's gone. It's what we do while we are here. So let's be mindful of our time and how we spend it. God is counting on you and I to finish the work that he started. And he knew that we were able. If we were not able, he would have raised up stones. He would have commanded the trees to go do it. He called us to do it because we were able. He has equipped us with all it takes. May we not fail him in Jesus' name. Therefore, having said that, our salvation is not complete until it leads us to the salvation of who? Others. So, on Sunday, Pastor was talking about the master who wanted to go on a journey and called his servants. A pound here, three pound here, another five here is the same way. Jesus is the master. He had gone on a journey. But before he left, guess what? He gave you your pound. He gave me my pound. When he comes again, he's going to require of me. How much have you invested? How much did you reap? What gain? What profit? May I not say, Father, I know you are a shrewd businessman. <laughs> Therefore, I hid it under my pillow. And I opened my Bible and slept on it at night so that nobody would come and steal it. May that not be my excuse in Jesus' name. May we be able to say, God, just like Paul said, I fought a good fight. You, you could look back and say, I finished well, Lord. I did what you asked me to do. May we make a calling and a lesson sure in Jesus' name. So we were saved to become God's salvation to the ends of the earth. Acts 13, 47. You have been saved 
to continue where Jesus Christ left. He said, For so has the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Amen. And in each of the first verses that I read, the Romans 1, 14 to 16, the Apostle Paul begins each verse with the word, I am. I am. How many times have you come about that word in the scripture? Who was it referencing? I am. I am. Isn't it funny? We are the only creature of God who bears that same name with him. I am. Praise the Lord. And we saw this in the book of John, in the gospel of John, where Jesus made reference to himself as I am. I took my time to look that up and I saw that in John 6, 35, Jesus declared to the people, I am the bread of life. In John 8, 12, he said, I am the light of the world. In John 10, 9, he said, I am the door. John 10, 11 and 14, he said, I am the good shepherd. John eleven twenty five. he said, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And John 15, 1 and 5 says, I am divine. Amen. So look, of, look at all of those I am that I just read. And you share that characteristics with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, with God. So to your neighbors, to people around you, friends and family, you should be, you should be the light to them. You should be the bread of life to them. So don't see that people, they're too bold to some. They bother me. I, I, I don't care, whatever. As long as everything is okay with me, it doesn't care what goes wrong with my neighbor. Uh -huh. You see how this scripture ties to one another? Bishop Apostle was telling us about the trap. Uh -huh. Everything ties. The mouse... Hey, they set a trap to catch me. Come and help me, ye other animals. They look at him. It's for you. We are big. Elephants, I'm so huge. The cow, uh -uh, with my horn, nobody can, nobody there comes near me. But what was the end of the story? Those who fed, they were powerful. Those who fed, they had strength. They fell. And the one that was set in the trap for initially escaped. So let's be concerned about what goes on around us. Amen. And not just what we have to gain. So in his letter to the Corinthians, that is Paul's letter, he alluded this divine connection that he, we all, not just Paul, have with Jesus Christ, the great I am. God of the whole testament said when they ask you who sent you he told moses tell them i am send you i think that was when we first saw that name i am so let them know i am sent you and as you carry yourself as you walk around remember you are god's extension to the next person amen so, but by the grace of God, 1 Corinthians 15, 10, he said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. That was all. So, you are what you are. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. You see what I said? When you've done so well, you know. 
you have kids at home, you said, how was your test today? Mm. Mm. You know that they didn't do well. But when you say, how was the test? I said, good. Quick to act. You say, yes, they have done their best. That is what we saw in Paul. Paul knew that he went far and beyond. Amen. He said, I labor more abundantly than they are. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was upon me. 1 Corinthians 15. So what we do with the gospel of Jesus Christ reveal to us who we are in the sight of God. And this is very, very important for us to know. What am I doing for him? So who we are in the sight of men does not really matter in the, in the eyes of him. Let's see Hebrews 14.13. Because many of us, we always crave the favor of men, accolade from men. That's why they call them men pleaser. We want to please the master. We want to be in the master's good record. So that when promotion comes, when it's time to reward, I will be quickly remembered. It doesn't work with God that way. Are you with me? Hebrews 4. Who is there? I think Runa was there. Praise God. He says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. It is God that we have to deal with, not man. And everything is plain before him. So it's not about what I do. What I show forth is about my heart. How is my heart with God? Do I have a right standing in my heart before God? Men will say, oh, she's good. She comes to church all the time. She doesn't miss service. What about my heart? So it's not about religion. It's about my relationship with Jesus Christ. And if I know this so well, I will know to carry on with the master's work. No matter what any other person feel, or no matter what they say. Amen. So having a look at these three scriptures, Romans 1, 14, 15, 16, we want to realize that, number one, we have been obligated. Number two, we must be eager. Number three, we must be excited. We saw that in Paul. Let's quickly look at it. He says, I am a debtor. I don't have anywhere to go. So I'm sold out to do this. Somebody paid a price over me. I've got to show my appreciation. I've got to show that I'm grateful. So I have to give back. And we even see it in the world we live in. We see people that have left school, the alumni. They try to give back to their old school. In the community, we see people who are made, they start to give back to the community where they come from. You are in a community of Christ Jesus. What are you trying to give back? What are you sowing back into the kingdom? Are you doing the will of the master? Or are you doing the work? Amen. Says some in verse 50 said, As much as is in me, I am ready. Eagerness. I am ready. I don't have any meat. I don't have anything. Just like we saw Jesus Christ at that well in John chapter 4. He was tired. He was fagged out. He said, and the disciple came back and said, I thought you said you were tired. Before we came, there is a multitude again. Because God will always give you strength to deliver each time and every time you step up. And in verse 16, he said, I am not ashamed. 
I'm so proud of this gospel. I'm so great, proud of this Christ, Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed. I will never deny him. My hand is already on the plow. I cannot look back. I'm sold out. I'm going all the way. I'm excited about it. So the Apostle Paul was a great blacksmith of the world. Broke it down. Beat it up. So that it will become easy to understand. Amen. So his insight into the truth of the gospel and the way he communicated them has not been matched by any Bible teacher. Not then and not now. Amen. Except for Jesus Christ himself. He was statical, suggestive, and incisive. He used the three, the three key words that reverberate through the corridors of time, revealing the heart of man that is sold out to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's look at the first one. Obligation. I'm obligated to preach the word of God. I'm a debtor. This Greek word Paul used to convey his desire to preach the gospel in Rome is ophilet. O P H E L E T E S, which means to be bound by a duty to do something. I am bound. I must go. It was like something was pushing him to go to that room. Even when everybody said you must not go. He was already made up. Even if that is the last thing that I'm going to do for Christ, I want to go there. I want to go there. I want to go preach there. I wanted to see Paul, who was Saul preaching in Rome. Amen. That must be of set doubt in the minds of those indebted to. So one who owns another something is so strong. I must deliver. I am a debtor to God. I am lost. He saved me. I was dead. He raised me. I didn't know where to go. He made a way for me. I must pay back. How many of us are feeling that way tonight? I must give back. I must give back. Amen. I must give back. So once you come to know the Lord and establish a relationship with him, it is upon you to pay what you owe. Remember, he bought you with a price. He bought you with a price. So we must pay what we owe. We are indebted to him. The devil didn't save us. So we are not indebted to the devil. As a matter of fact, that is why he keep coming against you. Because he doesn't want you to make it. Unfortunately, we give in. And we start to serve him. In different forms and shape. We see them all over the world. Subtly. Crept in. Eating up. Like the canker worm. Or like the time might. Amen. So we need to preach the gospel. It is expected of us. And we must see this as a two way depth. One, to share the gospel with the unsaved in order to discharge our debt so. That, that the debt that we owe, fulfill our own obligation to God as man to God. So if, you, if you've not been evangelizing, this is an opportunity. This is a way. You don't need to say you must be saved or you go to hell. There are several ways. If you ask God, God will give you wisdom by the Holy Spirit to go about it. 
Many of them on our jobs, they know we are Christians. When they have problems, they come. Come and pray with me. Oh, my child is doing this. Pray with them, follow up. One thing leads to the other. And God is able to help you to make many in their lives. In Jesus' name. So we are both debtors to our Savior and to the unsaved. So God is holding us accountable for that. Romans 4, 1, 14. I am a debtor both to the Greek and to the barbarians and to the wise and to the unwise. Even though the Bible says, Oh, no man, anything except for what? Love. Except for love. And Romans 13, 8 says, He that loveth what another has done what? You have fulfilled the law. It's not that love only me. It's, it's me, my mind. All about me. Every other thing does not concern me. As long as I'm in good shape, that's it. Amen. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 9.16, Paul said, For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I'm compared to preach. I love that, Pastor. When I preach the gospel, I don't make a boast because I'm compared. It's something that I must do. How do we, how do we compare that to what we see these days? Even in the church of God. I healed 10, 10, 10 people at my crusade yesterday. I raised the dead man in my church two days ago. It's everything me, mine. It is he that has given the power. Outside of God, nothing. So let's learn to ascribe the glory to God. Paul taught us that. My church did this. My ministry did this. Who owns the church and the ministry? Who made the way for the church and the ministry? Where is God factor? But said it here. Said even though I do these things, people are hid by my by my shadow, by my handkerchief, by my clothes, by everything. Said I dare not make a boast because I am compelled. To do it. May God help us in Jesus' name. And he said, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Woe to me. For if I preach the gospel, that is another version now, English standard. He said, If I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. I love that. English standard version. It gives me no ground. I preach the word. The Holy Spirit manifests. Does what he has to do. And now I did it. Uh -uh. For necessity is laid upon me. And woe to me if I do not preach. Because that is the reason I was saved. That my life may be a pointer. To people around me. To people that come in contact with me. That they may smell the fragrance of God upon my life. And want to be drawn nearer to him. Not to feel the stench. I said, are you a Christian at all? I thought they said you go to church. <clears throat> Amen. We are a light that is set upon the hill. We should attract and draw people to the master. And another version, the Berean version says, Yet when I preach the gospel, I have no reason to boast because I am obligated to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. And I love this one. It says, I don't have any reason to brag about preaching the good news. I don't have to flex. I don't have to brag. Preaching is something God told me to do. 
and if I don't do it, I am done. I am done. It is an assignment that we were handed with. It's like when Christ was going, he did what? He handed us the button. In a, in, in a race, we, all, we are all familiar with the, what do they call that race? Relay. Relay. Thank you. And the person hands over the button to the other one. Do they stop and hold the button and start to look at it? This is beautiful. Oh, it's even red and blue. You run with it. You have no time. As soon as you catch it, what do you do? You, you go on. Because you have to go deliver to the next person. You deliver to the next generation. You deliver to the next generation. Occupy till I come. Amen. So the preaching of the gospel of God in the person of his only begotten son is a necessity. It's a righteous obligation for everyone that has encountered the salvation of the gospel. Amen. So the preaching is something God told me to do. And if I don't do it, I am done. Your life is a Bible. Everybody is reading. Page by page. Chapter by chapter. What are you presenting to people? Boasting in whatever form is inimical to the preaching of the gospel. It is our divine obligation, our God-ordained duty. Paul announces his ruin if he fails to do this glorious job. He said, woe is me. I am doomed. I am ruined. What are you saying if you fail to preach the gospel? It's okay. God knows my schedule is so tight. I'm busy. I have between the children, the work, the hot. Ah, oh God, I, I don't even have time for myself. So God understands. I always say to myself, we all have 24 hours each day. How we use each of those 24 hours, we're going to give accounts. If you think your schedule is busy, Wait and hear somebody else's schedule. And God is going to ask you, you thought you were busy. Did you see that person? And what will you tell God? So, roll up your sleeve and walk the work of the master. Do his assignment while you yet have the opportunity. And God will help you in Jesus' name. So whom must we preach? Paul announces those to whom he is obligated to, he is obligated to preach to. His enthusiasm calls upon us to eliminate every suggestion to the contrary that the gospel can only be preached to those we want or those we are familiar with. If it is the gospel of God, we cannot pick and choose who to preach to. We have to preach to all that God brings away. I don't have to look at someone. And that's so interesting about God. If you were the neighbor of that Samaritan woman, would you ever preach to her? Knowing her kind of lifestyle. Amen. Or if you were those spies, will you enter the house of Rahab knowing she's a harlot? She might rape you when you try to sleep. <laughs> and you are so righteous. <laughs> and, and you, will you enter into their house? Will you even talk to them? Will you even take anything from them? Amen. So we are to preach to all. We shouldn't be selective. So we must preach the gospel of, the, of our God 
to the world that is so much love that he gave his only begotten son for. John 3, 16. We must preach to whoever cares to listen to us. I am a debtor, both to the Greek and to the barbarian, both to the wise and to the unwise. So the preaching of the gospel equalizes all men. It equalizes every rung of society. Rich, poor, black, white, educated, illiterate, and so on. So the gospel of Christ is a gospel of inclusion. There is no degree, no certificate. But if you do it so well, when we get over there, we get crowns, we get stars, just like the general. Amen. To the Greek, when Paul says he's under obligation to the Greek, he's talking about his indebtedness to those who are at the top of the society's ladder. They were the cultured, the educated of the ancient society. The Greek were refined, they were polished. They, were, they loved literature and the arts. They had been trained in social graces and manners. The Greeks were those who had arisen to the top of the social and cultural scene of the day. They have read philosophy, philosophers of Athens and were very conversant with the people on many, many learned subjects. Paul believed that he must bring the gospel to those who had ascended to the highest level position in their careers. So I'm not just obligated to preach to the children. If I'm sitting by somebody anywhere in the plane, in the bus, in the train, I could talk to them not even know who they were and we've seen testimonies of people like that amen i remember was it um there's this singer feel, feel something he was the one that sang the amazing grace in this gators yeah he said the first time he, he when he was in the plane he saw a woman and they were sitting together so when they were about to land, he gave him his cassette then, cassette. Say, this is my recorded song. I don't know, you might like it. The woman got home and somehow played it and loved it. He was the one that took that cassette to the re uh, a recorder and said, look, I, I, this boy, this man gave me this in the, in the plane. I listened to it. It's good. Listen to it. And that is how he got his recording label. What if he had kept mute and said, this is too clean? I don't think. And we all do that. We, we shortchange ourselves. We limit ourselves. No, they're too big. We can't talk to them. God, God said, open your mouth and I will feel it. Let the word of God be like a fire in your bone. You, you can't contain it. You just want to discharge it. And when you decide to, the Lord himself will be with you. It will speak through you. There will be power in your word. Amen. So the barbarians. Who were these barbarians? They were the complete opposite of the Greek. If the Greek were at the top of the social ladder, the barbarians occupied the lowest. They could not be any more base than they were. The barbarians were crude, rude, lacking in any social grace or cultural polish. They had no learning and could not even read. The word barbarian was a derisive term used by the Greeks to look down upon them. The ones we say from the ghettos. From the ghettos. You might see them with big chains, they are fake chains. They could talk. <laughs> 
<laughs> they will turn black and brown in the next minute. All their teeth with, and you can look at them and say, "Oh my God, who are?" You? They could easily be despised. God sent you to them. God needs their soul. Christ died for them, just like He died for you. He paid the same price that He paid on you on them. So they are not left out. We have to reach out to them. We have to reach out to them. So to the Greek mind, when the barbarians speak, their pronunciation of word may be so rough that they, are, they use abusive word. Aren't we used to that? Don't you see them? Because they don't have good education. So they want to talk, they, they, they just say it wrong. Amen. They could hardly be understood in what they were saying. When they spoke, it sounded as if they were saying Baba, Baba. So that's where they come up with the word barbarians. As a mocking word. Paul also determined to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. What about both of the wise and the foolish? In this context, the wise does not refer to those who are well taught in the things of the Lord. The reference is to those who are wise in the things of this world. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. We could read that up. So these are those who are wise in their own eyes. Those who have excelled to the highest level of worldly school, the PhD, the DDD, TDD, whatever. So don't you know who I am? I'm Doctor, Reverend, Archbishop, Pope. We come with the titles. We are learned. So they are educated in the philosophies and in the ideologies of this evil world. But the sad fact is they are unaware that they do not know the most important thing in life. God himself. As a matter of fact, they could use their, 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 their scientific knowledge to explain away the creation. So they are not wise in the matter of the kingdom of God. Instead, they are wise in the things that are spiritually bankrupt. So the foolish matches up with those barbarians. They are those who have never been educated. They grew up on the wrong side of the town. They have no financial advantage. They have no social privileges. They can't even afford any. They are just as foolish as they are. And they are yet in that foolish state, they are not seen beyond their nose and they are not ready to accept the gospel. But said, But I will go to them, I will break it down, I will help them to see the light in this world. I will not be tired if they don't understand it one time, I will go again, I will go again until they get it. That was poor determination. That was his kind of mindset. I must do this. I must accomplish this. So Paul cannot say that his ministry is solely to the upper class. No, it is also to the lower people. Whoever God brings your path is your candidate to hear the gospel. Just like we saw in the life of Paul. The word of God must be preached. If we fail to preach it, we are doomed. What about the eagerness to preach? That was the obligation. Anybody, I have to talk to them. I have to help them to understand what Christ did, why he came. One thing I, 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 I wrote down in my study when I was looking at this when i saw the i am then i remember the this movement the i am movement i said they got it they knew that we have that 
traits and characteristics with God. But where they made where they were wrong, they believe that it is true other means, true other gods, other higher power, including Jesus. I said, mm -mm. We are I am because our God is I am. We got the trait from him. So it can't be true other means, including that's where I removed the uh -uh. I, I I said, no, it's not including. He said, I am the door. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No other means, no other religious leader could make boast of that declaration except the Lord Jesus Christ. If he said it, it's because he knew that was who he was and who he is and who he will forever be. So don't be deceived, folks. You have what it takes. You have the original, the authentic, and move with it. Don't let anybody take that away from you. So Paul said, I'm eager to preach the gospel. Romans 1.15 says so as much as in me is i am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at rome also once he has found his purpose paul says i'm ready so if you know your purpose you'll be willing to go you won't wait for anybody to put you to urge you to beg you so what is your purpose for being saved. Have you discovered it? If you do not, you better go get it. Because you cannot preach the gospel if you don't know why you have been saved. So once you have probably estimated your two-way indebtedness to God and man, absolutely nothing can stop you from preaching the gospel. The Greek word translated ready is protomos, which means forward in spirit, that is predisposed. Eagerness, ready to do it. Without not. Amen. Amen. Carrying the idea of heightened willingness or readiness. Discovering your divine obligation heightens your level of readiness to preach the gospel. Nothing is absolutely more powerful, more beautiful than this description of the deliver, of the believer in relation to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What mattered to Paul was not the place of preaching but what he preached is not where when because most of the time we are looking for a suitable position a suitable environment and when it is where and i'm not maybe it's not ready today and the, this environment is not okay uh, people may be looking at us they will be wondering what am i doing with this woman or what am i doing with this person everybody knows them in this neighborhood oh, i don't want them to link me up to them eh? paul said that does not matter is what i have to say that matters to me just like our lord jesus christ he could have sat down under the tree and watched that woman come fetch her water, draw her water from the well and go back and not say, but Jesus said, no, it doesn't matter who she is, where she's been to, where she's evil now. I just have to give her that water, everlasting one that she can never test again. Amen. Most, more often than not, we pick easy places to preach the gospel. We must preach anywhere and everywhere that we see sinners or we see people doing what is wrong. Verse uh, Romans 115b, I'm ready to preach to you that are in Rome also. The word to preach the gospel 
is one of the Greek eugelizo, one of the Greek language. We derive the English word evangelism from. You can almost hear evangelism in eugelizo. The word also clearly implies that Paul has been preaching the gospel eagerly wherever he goes, whether in Corinth, Ephesus, Galatia, or Colossus. Amen. Wherever you find yourself, speak the word. Talk the talk. And allow the Holy Spirit to finish up the job. You are to sow the seed and God is able to water it to fruition. Amen. So the gospel thrives in hard places where we think it cannot. Look at that woman by the well. 3,000 followers in one day. Who could have thought she could do that? So the gospel thrives in hard places. Rome holds the greatest fascination for Paul in his commitment to the gospel. It is a very high, tough place indeed. Rome was the capital of Roman Empire. Flagrant depravity was prevalent. Immorality prevailed at the time Paul wrote his epistles. Sexual sin in the form of incest, prostitution, and homosexuality was common. So, gay or no gay, it has always been. We've been fighting it, we'll continue to fight it. The fact that it's been there all along does not make it right. It was wrong then, it is wrong now, and it will forever be wrong. Amen. So we have to preach against it. It's a sin to God, incest, prostitution, homosexuality. There were also high rates of divorce and murder. Rome was a rotting place. It was also the slave capital of the world in those days. So imagine how tough this place was. Yet Paul expressed eagerness to go preach there. It is the gospel that matters, not the place. Paul did not mind the cesspool of iniquity that was in Rome, regardless of the gross spiritual darkness that Rome was engulfed in, Paul declared that I am eager to go preach in Rome also. I must make them hear my voice. They must hear the word of God. John 1 5 says, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The gospel is a light, is able to turn any darkness or any darkened place into lightness. Just speak it and watch what God will do with the word that has been spoken. So what is your room today? Where is your hardest place to witness? Is it your closest friend? Your family, your colleague, your schoolmates, the white people of color, immigrants or foreigners, who are those people that you have written off that they are impossible to reach with gospel? Who are those people in your mind that you just concluded on? This one can never hear. Let me not waste my energy. Let me not waste my time. No matter what I say, they will never believe me anyway. Like Paul, we must have that eagerness to reach everybody for Christ. Like Caleb, who wanted the biggest mountain with the biggest giant. Paul is eager to go to Rome. We must be ready and eager to go to the hardest places in our own world and reach the hardest people around us and preach the gospel of Christ to them. There is no excuses in preaching the word of God. 
even in Rome. Amen. Passionate for the gospel. As I have already indicated above, as we have seen so far, the Greek word protumos is a compound word that pictures a runner's forward learning, pushing forward to preach the gospel. The key word in the compound expression tumors is the same word for passion, which means heavy breathing. <sighs> So two must give the ideas of a horse that is breathing heavily, ready to charge into battle. So you see how God wants us to approach his gospel. Not leisurely, not at will, not when it is comfortable, when it is convenient. No. It's to just do it right now, right here, whatever it takes. I've got to give it in. So the spiritual idea of tumors cannot be overemphasized. We should be all struck by the apostles care depiction of the passion for the gospel. It is God's given passion driven by our love for God. When you love somebody, you want to please them. You don't want to hurt them. You don't want to do anything that will sadden them you just want to be there do you want this are you okay hey what else do you want it's the same way if we love god his burden will be our burden what concerns him concerns us he has beat is our heartbeat we run with it we don't stop second corinthians 5 14 says for the love of christ constraineth us because because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we all dead. We are constrained with that love. So I want to see if my fellow man, if my neighbor, if my family, if somebody falls, I fall. If they fail, I fail. As long as God has put them within my area of influence i have a responsibility to preach the gospel and make sure the word of god gets to them amen i know i know in ministry they talk a lot about the 10 by 40 window last time i checked most of the countries or most many of the nations have heard about Christ. So we, there was a time we thought 10 by 40 Indo could not be penetrated. People have gone there. They have penetrated. Some of the countries, some of the nations are believers. And it is believed that once that angle is taken over, then the end has fully come. Because they are the one that's is keeping us. So don't think there is more time. Look out. The harvest is already. So go there and do your own part. You and I have a lot to do for God. We do not have time to waste anymore. So the passion for the gospel is a love enterprise. Preaching gospel is a love affair not a duty bound mm -mm. we love god because he first loved us the apostle is pouring out god's burden concerning the good news so we must hear what the spirit is saying to us we must lean towards the gospel with our entire being as horses in love with christ we must always be ready to charge ahead with the gospel into the battlefield of our own very world we must become embattled with the gospel. We are at war with the forces of darkness, the evil ones, the wickedness of this world. We must use this great weapon of our warfare to advance the kingdom of God to all the parts of the world and to the ends of the earth. Paul describes all of us as eager preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The next reason 
for this revelation. Amen. I am not ashamed, the unashamed of the gospel. Say, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believe. Jew first and also to the Greek. We've seen the obligation. We see the eagerness. Now we see the excitement. I am not ashamed. So the apostle makes his lifestyle so clear to the Romans. I am not ashamed. It is more than a decision he has made. It is a conviction. The man is living in the greatest of all revelation. I am not ashamed. He did not say, I'm not going to be ashamed. Nor did he say, if I get to Rome and consider the situation there, I may not be able to, or to do what I have to do, I will not be ashamed. Absolutely. His mind was fixed. His mind, his heart was attuned. And he was passionate about what God has put in his mind to do. The gospel is a power of God unto salvation. It's not we. It's not what we are. Mm -mm. It's that power in the gospel of Jesus Christ that changes man. I'm not the one who changes. So if I, if I talk to somebody and by the grace of God that person changes, it's not me that changed the person. It's the power of the gospel that did it. Because I, I cannot change anybody. But the gospel is potent enough to make a change in the life of man. Amen. For whosoever, Luke 9, 26, say, for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my word, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his glory and in his fathers and of his holy angels. Isn't that why God, what the scripture tells us? On that last day, many will say, God, but I cast out devil in your name. I called you and you answered. I heal, I raise. God will say, get out of my sight because I know you not. There was no passion. We only did the work. We did not fulfill his will. May that not be our portion in Jesus' name. So the gospel of Paul is still very relevant to us today, to the political, to the religious leader, to the low, to the high. We are constrained to preach the gospel and we are not ashamed to do that. I implore you to fire up, roll up your sleeve. The, we don't have the time. I wish there is enough room. But if this thing is, has, we've been saying it for over 2,000 2, years or about 2,000 years. I don't know for how long we have to say it. So while you have the breath of life, do what you have to do. Yesterday, some people left home. I'm going to school. I'm going to work. Some of them didn't go back. That was their clearance call. That was the end of the assignment. They are facing the master today, giving account how, do, how they utilize their pound. You have a pound in your hand. God has laid it at your feet. He gave it to you. He commanded, occupy till I come. Use it wisely till I come. Touch one another till I come. Minister to one another till I come. Are you doing the will of the master? Or you are doing the work of the master? Are you doing the will of the master? Or you are doing the work of the master? 
May the words that we hear every now and then not stand against us at the last day. May we be able to stand boldly before his throne and God will tell us, Welcome, thou faithful servant, enter into your rest. May that be our portion in Jesus' name. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. In Jesus' name. Amen.